ashes of the legendary rock band Nirvana arose the Foo Fighters, Dave Grohl's second shot at achieving musical success, which eventually forged a name for themselves as one of the greatest rock bands of all time. For almost 30 years, the Foo Fighters remained highly proficient, churning out hit after hit for three decades. The band had amassed a following over the years, while Dave Grohl has built a reputation as one of the coolest figures in rock. However, later in their career, the band would encounter a crossroads when tragedy put their future in question. How did the Foo Fighters come together to become one of the all-time greats? Stay tuned as we explore the story of the Foo Fighters, from their beginnings in the mid-90s to their sustained success throughout the years. Dave Grohl After Nirvana The sudden death of Nirvana's Kurt Cobain in 1994 sent shockwaves throughout the world. Kurt and Nirvana single-handedly transformed the musical landscape and culture of the 90s through their songs and their defiant attitude. When Kurt passed away, not only did the world lose one of its most iconic figures, but it also spelt the end for Nirvana. In the aftermath, Nirvana's drummer Dave Grohl stepped away from the music scene, depressed and unsure of how to move forward with his career. He had received offers to play drums for Danzig and Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, but declined, feeling that sitting down behind the kit would only remind him of Nirvana. After a few months, however, his outlook changed. He entered Robert Lang Studios in October of 1994 to record six songs that he had written, intending the sessions to be some sort of cathartic therapy for him. Dave did the vocals and recorded all the instruments for all his songs. Within a week, he had finished recording all his songs and sent copies to colleagues for feedback. To hide his identity, he used the name The Foo Fighters. Eventually, record labels took notice of the tapes and Dave signed a deal with Capitol Records. Since the album was essentially a one-man project, Dave needed a band for live performances. He hired drummer William Goldsmith and bassist Nate Mandel, both from the recently disbanded Sunny Day Real Estate, and Nirvana touring guitarist Pat Smear. The Foo Fighters made their live debut in February of 1995 and continued performing in a few small venues. In July, the band's self-titled debut album was released and the Foo Fighters went on a supporting tour. Mainstream Breakthrough After wrapping up their tour in 1996, the Foo Fighters started their preparations for a follow-up. Dave wrote all the songs again, while the other band members helped with arrangements. In the middle of recording, Dave replaced Goldsmith's drumming with his own, unsatisfied with the latter's performance. This decision frustrated Goldsmith, and he eventually quit. Looking for a replacement, Dave got in touch with Alanis Morissette's touring drummer, Taylor Hawkins, to ask for recommendations. Taylor offered to play for the band and eventually got the role. This also started a lifelong friendship between Dave and Taylor. The band's second album, The Color and the Shape, was released in May of 1997. It's credited as the album that introduced the Foo Fighters to a larger mainstream audience, largely thanks to its second single, Everlong. It remains the band's best-selling album in the U.S. Shortly after its release, Pat Smear exited the group due to exhaustion. He was replaced by Dave's former bandmate and his pre-Nirvana band, Scream, Franz Stahl. However, Stahl's stint in the band was short-lived. He was ejected from the band during preparations for their next album due to creative differences. The Foo Fighters' third album, There's Nothing Left to Lose, was released in November of 1999. The band recorded the album as a trio in Dave's new home studio, which he christened Studio 606. The album spawned the single Learn to Fly, which became the band's first to enter the Billboard Hot 100. It also bagged the Foo Fighters their first ever Grammy Award in 2001, when it won Best Rock Album. The Foo Fighters in the 2000s Momentum was on the Foo Fighters' side as they entered the new millennium. Dave Grohl and Taylor Hawkins struck a relationship with legendary rock titans Queen and inducted them into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2001. But later that year, the band experienced a scare when Taylor overdosed on heroin, leaving him in a two-week coma. Dave was beside him throughout his coma. The thought of losing another bandmate and friend made Dave question his future in music again. Fortunately, Taylor woke up and started his road to recovery. 
During this period, Dave assisted his friends from Queens of the Stone Age by playing the drums on their breakout album, Songs for the Deaf. By the end of 2001, Taylor had successfully recovered and the band was ready to record their fourth album. However, its production was marred with problems. The band was unsatisfied with their performances and the recordings, leading to tensions between members and subpar outputs. Having gone stale and unproductive, the Foo Fighters took a break, during which its members engaged in other musical projects. Despite remaining tensions, they reunited for the Coachella Festival in 2002, and Dave believed it would be their last concert as a band. However, after enjoying their performance, the Foo Fighters agreed to continue. They eventually finished their album one by one and released it in October 2002. It was a success and gave the band their second Grammy Award when it won Best Rock Album in 2004. Having found their element again, the Foo Fighters expanded their scope for their next album. 2005's In Your Honor was a double album, with one disc featuring a heavier repertoire of songs and the other featuring all acoustic tracks. Their next album, 2007's Echoes, Silence, Patience and Grace was another success and won two Grammy Awards in 2008. Best Rock Album and Best Hard Rock Performance for the album's lead single, The Pretender. But that wasn't the only victory for the band that year. On June 7th, the Foo Fighters played a show in London's legendary Wembley Stadium and were joined by Led Zeppelin members Jimmy Page and John Paul Jones for a performance of Zeppelin's songs Rock and Roll and Ramble On. Having been busy for the past four years, the Foo Fighters opted to take a break from touring while they prepared their next record. In 2009, their record label RCA released a Greatest Hits album, which featured two new songs, the lead single, Wheels, and Move Forward. Continued success in the 2010s and other projects. In 2010, the band tapped Butch Vig, the producer of Nirvana's seminal 1991 album, Nevermind, to produce their next album. The Foo Fighters released their seventh studio album, Wasting Light, the following year. The album saw the return of Pat Smear as a member of the band after his exit in 1997. It was a huge success and became the band's first album to top the Billboard 200. Additionally, it received a whopping six nominations at the 2012 Grammy Awards, of which it won four. The band spent the next couple of years touring to support the album. The Foo Fighters went extra ambitious for their next album, Sonic Highways. The eight tracks that made up the album were recorded in eight different cities and aimed to capture the essence of each city where it was recorded. At the same time, Dave directed a docu-series entitled Foo Fighters – Sonic Highways. The series aired on HBO and covered the album's making while exploring the musical history of the cities where its songs were recorded. Around this time, the Foo Fighters had already established themselves as one of the premier rock bands in the world. As a testament to this, a thousand musicians in Italy, known as the Rockin' 1000, performed the band's song Learn to Fly in July 2015. The performance was a way to invite the Foo Fighters to play live in their arena. The video of the performance went viral and caught the attention of the band, who agreed to stage a show in Cessna, Italy in November of that year. It was also around this period when Dave broke his leg during a concert, but came back to finish the show while seated and being treated by medics. After canceling a few dates so he could undergo surgery, the band returned with Dave performing on a custom-built throne, proving again why he's the coolest guy in rock. The tour was then renamed The Broken Leg Tour. The band concluded its tour in November of that year and released an EP entitled St. Cecilia. They then announced that they would be going on an indefinite hiatus. The band returned in 2017 with a new album, Concrete and Gold. The Foo Fighters began working on a follow-up in 2019, but its release was delayed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Their 10th album, Medicine at Midnight, was released in February 2021. That year, the band was also inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in their first year of eligibility. This made Dave Grohl a two-time Hall of Famer after being inducted as a member of Nirvana in 2014. In July, the band tapped into their more playful side by releasing a cover album of disco songs entitled Hail Satin under the name DGs, The Death of Taylor Hawkins. 2022 began with a lot of promise for the band, as they released their first comedy horror movie, 
Studio 666. The film starred the band as themselves and featured them attempting to record an album in a haunted mansion before Dave becomes possessed by an evil spirit and the members are killed off one by one. Although it performed below expectations during its opening weekend, it was a fun alternative project for the band that saw them further expanding their horizons. Sadly, the fun would turn into tragedy just a month after the film's release. On March 25, 2022, paramedics found drummer Taylor Hawkins dead in his hotel room in Bogota, Colombia. The band was in town to play at the Festival Estereo picnic that night, but had to pull out at the last minute due to Taylor's sudden passing. A candlelight vigil was held at the event instead, and the Foo Fighters announced the death of their drummer on their social media accounts, sending the rock world into a state of shock and grief. No official cause was given for Taylor's death. In the days that followed, fellow musicians and friends of the band paid tribute to the late drummer in their live performances, including Elton John, Miley Cyrus, Chad Smith of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and Liam Gallagher of Oasis. Queen drummer Roger Taylor, who became friends with him, dedicated his obe to him. After six months of silence and mourning, the Foo Fighters held a tribute concert for Taylor at Wembley Stadium on September 3rd. The concert featured guests such as ACDC's Brian Johnson, Metallica's Lars Ulrich, Brian May and Roger Taylor of Queen, Led Zeppelin's John Paul Jones, and Taylor's son Oliver, who played the drums on the song My Hero in honor of his father. A second concert tribute was held on September 27th at the Kia Forum in Los Angeles. To close off their devastating 2022, the Foo Fighters released a statement in December confirming that they will continue making music. However, they made it clear that the fans can expect a completely different band. That could mean a lot of things. Perhaps slight tweaks to the band's sound or their lyrics or some changes that can be expected in the wake of Taylor's death. Regardless of the band's future direction, what's clear as daylight is that the story of the Foo Fighters is far from over.